Hey everyone, welcome back to the Observatory. I'm your host, Kyle Kerwin at Big Eye, and today we're speaking with Ethan Aaron. Uh, Ethan is the CEO and founder of Portable, which helps data teams connect the long tail business applications, which might not normally have an ELT connector available for them, to their data warehouses, all with no code. Uh, previously, Ethan has held roles in BI teams, m and and strategy. He's been a product manager, um, but he's also an expert at community building, and he's been on the front lines of a number of conversations going on right now about the modern data stack, tooling, what's going on in data in general. So Ethan, welcome to the show. We're really excited to have you on today. Excited to be here. Um... Yeah, excited for the conversation. It should be fun. All right, great. So we've got a few questions for you today. And then, uh, of course, uh, the rapid fire at the end. Maybe to kick us off, um, you you share a lot of thinking kind of very publicly with the community. I'm sure plenty of folks have seen you posting on LinkedIn and things like that. Um, the modern data stack is a pretty common theme in, in the conversations that you have with people in public. How would you explain the modern data stack? And specifically, if you were to recommend one, to let's say a new data team, how would you explain what it even is and, and what would be your recommendation for a modern data stack? So let me start by saying that the, the term modern data stack is overloaded at this point. Um, five years ago, it was a lot simpler. The modern data stack was an ELT tool, extract some data from your business applications, put it into a data warehouse and build a dashboard. Goal number one was just turn raw data from systems into insights to better make strategic decisions. It was simple, easy to understand, modern, for the time. Um, today, it's a lot more complicated. There's hundreds of different tools. There's various levels of complexity where for a small startup, you might need two tools for your data stack. For a large enterprise, you might need a hundred. You probably don't need a hundred, but you, you might. To me, when I think about data stacks and setting up data teams, the first question I always ask is, what is the objective? What are you actually trying to accomplish from a business perspective? If you are creating a data team and the goal is, build five dashboards for your CEO to better run the business. That's the goal. What's the MVP way of doing that? You might need a data warehouse. You, you might not. If all your data is living in a database, you could probably just query it directly. Um, maybe you need data from business applications. Maybe like maybe you use Zendesk or MailChimp or HubSpot or Salesforce. In that case, you definitely need a data warehouse and you need an ELT tool to get the data into the warehouse. And you need a visualization tool to, to query it and, and build analytics. If you're a big enterprise and you're trying to build data products for customers or for internal consumers, data observability, critical, like real-time analytics, most likely valuable for you, um, embedded visualization capabilities. So when you think about, when I think about data stacks and data teams, it, it's a journey. It's like, where are you in the journey? Like, are you literally starting and you just need a dashboard? Great. Don't buy 30 tools. Are you an enterprise and you're trying to productionize things that started off as a few dashboards and now they're a mess. At that point, you need you need more tools, you need more architecture, you need more of a data model, um, data contracts, that type of stuff. Um, so there, there are scenarios where people need everything, but for, for most teams, all you need, data visualization tool, data warehouse, and a way of getting data into it to prove value. From there, what's the next investment? Like, and a lot of that just depends on on the company and the use cases and the, the next way to create value for that for that enterprise. Yeah, it sounds like you're a big proponent of simplicity, which I'm sure many people would appreciate. I, I think there's a few folks who are kind of tired of, you know, how many tools there are sort of in the space these days. It, one thing that I didn't hear in your answer was any specific answer on any one of those particular components. Is that is that true? Like, do you not make a recommendation about like, hey, everyone should use this particular data warehouse? It sounds like you're more thinking about what are the slots that I need to fill in to build my stack? Let's start there. Data warehouses, biggest ones you're going to have. Snowflake, BigQuery, Redshift, and then the databases, whether it's Postgres, et cetera, or real-time databases. 90% of use cases, it literally does not matter. It's a question of cost. It's, so like the biggest drivers of a data warehouse are going to be, is your company a Google company or an AWS company or an Azure company, or do you need multi-cloud? If you're a Google company, use BigQuery. It's great. If you're an Amazon co company, Redshift, great. If you don't want to be tied into either one and you want multi-cloud support and an ecosystem, use Snowflake. If you're just trying to query some data and put it into a visualization tool, it honestly doesn't matter. Um, you, could, you could use a Postgres environment on your local machine if it gets the job done. So like, there's that aspect. Visualization tools, slightly different. Um, if you're a big enterprise, you need a ton of different users and really advanced visualizations, like the actual charts and aesthetics are really difficult for 
these companies to build. Things like Power BI, Tableau can offer visualization capabilities that a lot of other companies can't. There's a middle tier companies that offer a lot of visualization capabilities, but also help with the modeling aspects, things like Looker. I'm transparent about this online too. Retool is awesome. Like we, we use Retool. It's very cost effective. Not only can you use it to write, write SQL, build dashboards, um, but you can also use it for internal admin dashboards and, and CRUD applications. Kind of the MVP stack, in my opinion, is like get data in, put it into a warehouse, visualize it. There's kind of two big buckets. There's your big connectors, like Fivetran. If you need big, reliable connectors to Salesforce and SAP and Oracle, Fivetran is a reliable, awesome solution for that problem. It's expensive, but it's a great solution. If you need things in your own cloud environment or outside the US, Airbyte, Meltano, Stitch slash, slash Singer, you can deploy the code yourself. Um, and then where portable fits in is the long tail stuff you can't find anywhere else. If you do not want to deal with a connector to your random HR tool, but you want a connector to it, that's where portable fits in. To me, it's the, the tools don't really matter. Like an ELT, if you need a connector from HubSpot to Snowflake or HubSpot to BigQuery, you have 10 options and they probably all work. It's better to spend your time building the dashboards and generating insights that create value than spending three months trying to pick the perfect tool. I think a lot of people would agree with that. It's interesting, this conversation around, you know, like, let's just keep it simple and stay focused on the business needs. I feel like that's a theme that I've seen quite a lot sort of out again in the public conversation. What are the most interesting topics that are sort of out there in sort of the public space? Modern data stack aside, just generally in the data ecosystem, what do you feel like are sort of the, the most interesting topics that are sort of being discussed these days? To, to me, there's a couple things that are that are, that are fascinating. If you think about the data world, like all the people that show up to Snowflake Summit or go to Coalesce or go to these things and talk about data stacks and data teams and analytics and operational analytics, um, the ecosystem of companies is small. Like it, it's probably 10,000 teams with a proper data function um, with the modern data stack. Relative to the the universe of companies, that is a very, very small fraction of the companies. So there are kind of two things to think about in the data world today. And both of them are massive opportunities, but they're both very, very different opportunities that need to be thought of separately. Opportunity number one, those 10,000 companies have data observability problems. They have speed and latency issues. They need to move aspects of their pipeline from batch every 24 hours to real time. That that permeates their entire data stack and their entire culture, everything. So there is a big opportunity for those companies to move into kind of the bleeding edge of how do you productionize things? How do you make them more scalable? How do you do them in fast in, in real time? Um, and I think there, a lot of the conversation is taking place there. The other end of the spectrum that I, I, I don't see enough conversation taking place around, but I believe the opportunity is 10x as big. If we have 10,000 data teams out there today, there's probably another 90,000, like it, like the 100,000 that could be using a data stack. So the question of not how do we sell the next thing to the 10,000 people, but how do we get the next 10,000 people onto something that resembles a data stack, even if it's super basic to start? There, there's a lot of companies, um, we work with a number of them, um, companies like Mozart Data, Kabula, Y42, uh, where they're at the intersection of the two. They help data teams simplify things, not have to deal with as many contracts, et cetera. But they also have the opportunity to go help team, help companies that have no data team, no data infrastructure, no analysts, et cetera. And as an ecosystem, I think we could go compete on feature by feature, which ELT tool is best for this connector. Like, or we could just go get 10 more people to sign up and build a data stack. So like to, to me that there's such an unbelievable opportunity to create value from people that don't have an analyst today, that don't have a data stack today. And, and I think that's underserved in the conversations, in the technologies, in the um, opportunities that, 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 that we're talking about in the market right now. And that kind of makes sense, right? Like if you're thinking about, you know, where, where users of a data tool might live, like obviously you're going to go look at those, you know, those 10,000 companies where they're already spending money on a data stack, but you're right. There's, there's a ton of teams that don't, you know, they're doing things kind of the old fashioned way. I always joke that like, you know, your barber, uh, you know, down the street or whatever is never going to have a data stack, but like they are using, they might be using square, uh, square terminal for payments. Well, right. And yeah. they may be getting analytics from that, that they're just getting it verticalized through their service from square, well, but they're probably looking at some sort of numbers week to week to look at how their business is performing, 
times a day that people are, are going in there. So we're talking about oh. like an example of like, well, they, you know, they're never going to have a data stack, but it's like they might in some way. So, so it's a funny example because like we integrate with some systems that a lot of enterprise data teams don't ever think about. So if you think about like restaurants or barber shops, things that come into play, like your point of sale system, whether it's Square, Toast, whatever. Number two, like your employee systems, like you actually have employees that have salaries and benefits. Like for a barber shop, payroll is a really important thing to understand in addition to revenue. Um, and then the third one for both restaurants and barbershops and these, and these types of these types of companies is um, time tracking and kind of checking into and out of work. And in a lot of scenarios, those are different tools. So if you think about someone going into the barbership or going home at night after running their small business, it would be great if they could just pull up a single dashboard that shows their bank account, their square payments, their um, time tracking for their employees, their schedule for the next week, the, the marketing that they're running online um, or through uh, advertisements and like get it on a dashboard. Are they, is the barbershop going to hire a SQL analyst? No, they won't. Um, but should they have like cross platform insights available to them? I, I believe they should. And I think that like, I think it's a massive opportunity to, to help unlock. It's technically very challenging, but it is a massive opportunity um, for us as an industry to think about things like barbershops because because there's a ton of, ton of value to be created there. One topic you mentioned actually earlier was data contracts. And uh, this is uh, something that, you know, just interviewed somebody about recently, actually. And I think it's, uh, it's a super interesting uh, concept. It's one of these topics that I've been hearing about lately. Uh, anyone that follows you might know that you, you have an opinion on data contracts. And uh, so I'd love to hear about, you know, first, what are they? Second, what what's your take on them? So data contracts are the idea that you have a producer of data within an enterprise. Maybe it's the engineering team has a database of all the transactions. And then you have consumers downstream that want to do stuff with that. Maybe someone wants to build a product on top of that data, but, but from a data perspective, someone else wants to build a dashboard, whether for internal purposes or external purposes. Historically, the analyst or the data team just starts querying the database directly. And then they build this dashboard and then they use it for financial reporting. And then one day the metrics are off and they look over at the engineering team and say, what did you do? You just broke our system. And the engineering team looks over and is like, what are you doing with our data? Like, we never knew you, you were doing this. Like, we're not accountable to, to you. Like, where, where did this come from? So there's a lack of communication taking place between the two. Um, and the proposed solution is data contracts um, that are effectively a defined interface between that engineering team and consumers of that data. So the, the easiest example is, instead of a data analytics team querying the database directly, they can do that for ad hoc analysis, but in production scenarios, there is a defined set of data that the engineering team commits to supporting and the data team needs for consumption and product development, where there is an understanding that it will remain consistent. There are downsides to this approach. Um, there, there are a lot of benefits to doing so, especially in very, very large enterprises where things are decentralized. And that's where most of the conversation is today. It's data ca contracts are amazing. They unlock speed and flexibility, but also give everyone like very clearly defined interfaces. It's like the trend of service oriented architecture and APIs for everything inside the enterprise. So they sound amazing. All the conversation today is generally positive about data contracts. I personally think there's also a downside to them. It, it's not they're universally bad, but before thinking, oh, we need data contracts for everything, you have to ask yourself some questions because just like APIs, when you build an interface that other people build against, you have to maintain that. And you as an engineering team or you as a data producer now have these rigid constraints that you, you have to build with it. So the, 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 key, the key takeaway here is for large enterprises, like using things for production use cases like financial reporting, understanding what that interface looks like makes a ton of sense. Um, for most scenarios, to me, even at the large enterprises, I don't think the answer is, here's the interface, are we aligned that that's perfect? I think the answer is a joint vision. If you're doing financial reporting on top of data from an engineering team, aligning on the actual fields of data that are coming out of the database doesn't actually convey to the engineers what's the point. Like they're not actually bought into what you're doing, they just have signed off that you are doing it. And like, it's, it's kind of them passively saying, that's fine, you can do that, like we'll maintain it, sure. The better, in my opinion, the better approach is a joint vision for what we're actually trying to do with the data. 
if the data is being used for financial reporting and the engineering team is bought in that they the data will be available to do financial reporting and the data team is going to use it to do so the actual interfaces in the fields are secondary like if things change both people know that the financial reporting needs to stay accurate they will communicate with each other and they will come up with a solution and the interface can change and i think that's fine if the goal is a goal and everyone's aligned towards the goal you'll find a way to get there i think creating arbitrary definitions of interfaces with fields and schemas and types doesn't align anyone with a goal it's very possible a data team is saying hey we're doing this financial reporting and the engineering team says have you thought about these other metrics that we also have or hey we can go generate this for you if you don't bring them into the conversation around this is the goal and all you say is this is the interface you're missing out on collaboration opportunities and that, that's the down that's the biggest downside of, of data contracts in my opinion. I, I see that makes sense I, this reminds me of the phrase the map is not the territory it sounds like it sounds to me like you're you're saying like a map is a useful thing and there's a reason and a time to have a map but let's agree on what the territory is in the first place and then we can bring the map in if necessary i definitely would love to hear uh counterpoints on this i know this is, uh, this is an, a, an interesting topic if you have an opinion on data contracts and you want to drop a comment uh, below. I'm sure uh, Ethan would love to chat with you. So one more big question for you. If you could get the leaders and managers of data teams everywhere, just to listen to one piece of advice that you have uh, that you think would improve things, you know, pretty universally for everybody, what would that thing be? Uh, and, and why do you think they would follow that advice that you have for them? As the leader of a data team, there are really two things you should be thinking about. What is the value you are creating that's either going to be revenue or cost savings those are the only two ways and what is the cost to do it and the cost is a combination of technology and people a lot of people ignore people costs when they think about their data team and then they end up with five ten twenty thirty person teams that cost millions of dollars and they're focused on technology they're not focused on creating driving revenue or saving money so to me all like data teams aren't there to explore to cool tools and technologies and write code Data teams are supposed to impact decision-making to drive revenue, automate workflows to save money and do so in a cost-effective way without costly technology and, and people like that is it. It's it, it, like, if you don't think about your data team as a profit and loss center, like you're just burning money in my opinion. And tying it back to business value. That's uh, I feel like th this is universal. This isn't just the data team, right? This pretty much yeah. anybody who works at any business, right? But you've always got to bring it back to like, what are we doing for the for the company as a whole? The, the other consideration there is like, if you run the data team and you do that, and you say, these are the decisions we impact for the CEO, these are the costs that we save by automating workflows with some ELT into a warehouse with reverse ETL, and you quantify it and you say, this is the impact, These this is the hours we saved. It's a lot easier to get buy-in for more headcount or for more technology or to expand the, the scope. And if you don't think about that and all you do is technology, why would your manager, why would the CEO ever give you more resources if you can't explain the impact of the business? So to me, it's both personal, like if you're the head of data and you want, and you want responsibilities and scope and all this type of stuff, great value. Like that's, it's, it's that simple. This is why when, whenever we're here at Big Eye, when we're talking to somebody who's looking at data observability, one of the first questions we always talk about is where does data go in the business? Like, let's not talk about yeah. the stack. Let's not talk about, you know, like what causes a pipeline to break? Like that's, like you said, that's all secondary, right? The question always stems from like, cool, if a pipeline goes down, what's the actual impact? Like who's impacted? Is it your customers? Yeah. Is it your executives? Is it a partner? How are they impacted? Who finds out about it? So yeah, always, always from, from the business working backwards. I don't know if I'm allowed to ask questions, but, um, do you find, which one do you find is more impactful? Like quantifying that with numbers of like, hey, this is the, the number of hours we saved, the dollars on technology that we that that we didn't spend, or anecdotes. Because I, I, I believe both are extremely powerful. A lot of numbers can come across as fake, but a lot of testimonials, like the CRO quoted as saying, we, we would have lost $500,000 in deals if it wasn't for our pipelines being robust and observable. Like, when I think about the value you're creating, I think I think in terms of both the quantifiable value and the like anecdote, the hard anecdotes from leaders 
Um, is that is that what you're seeing totally. as well? Is it, is it totally. I, I well, you you were in product management, so I, you know I, I was as well prior to this. I guess in some some sense I still am. But the the way that I always used to run research programs was first it was qualitative. It was okay. Let's go talk to customers and say like, okay, here's your quote, here's your anecdote, and then yep. after that you can then go out with a survey. And you can get some actual quantification on it. You can say, you know, like, yeah. how often is this actually breaking? Like, how many people are actually impacted by this? Like, what was the predicted dollar impact to the company? Um, but I feel like the, the place to start is always with, if a human being somewhere was not bothered by this, that's kind of the end of your, that's the, that's the end oh, of the thread, yeah. right? Because so, if, if it was a real problem and there's genuinely no one at the entire company who felt any pain from that problem, you know, that yeah. seems like a pretty rare case. So, you know, I think the anecdotes yeah. thing, yeah. it's not enough on their, by themselves to justify an investment, but they're super, they're super important to know, like, what human being did this impact and how did it affect them? 100%. Totally. All right, great. You ready for rapid fire? Yeah, let's cool. do it. What do you got for Okay, me? question one. You can either have unlimited battery life on all your devices, or you could have constant free Wi-Fi everywhere you go. Which do you choose? Wi-Fi. Just having access to like, information would be so simple, and battery technology is getting to be pretty good. Fair enough, fair enough. Okay. Number two, uh, you get to choose a board of directors to help you run your own life. Who's the first person you put on the board? My mom. Great answer. Great answer. <laughs> Shout out to mom. Yep. She will watch this at some okay. point. Don't worry. All right. Hi, mom. Uh, all right. Number three. Overnight, you can magically gain expertise in any one technical skill or capability of your choice. What is that thing? Learning. I don't know if that's a technical skill, but the best thing to learn about, in my opinion, is how to learn efficiently. It's like reading books, on like speed reading and other stuff like that, because it compounds. If you can learn how to learn more efficiently, like then the next thing you can do it five times as fast. Compounding advantages sounds good. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us today on this episode of the Observatory. Today we spoke with Ethan, who's the CEO and founder of Portable. If you want to learn more about Portable, you'll find a link down in the description below. If you have comments about data contracts, if you think they're great, if you're using them, if you're not using them and you think they're terrible, uh, leave a comment down below. Ethan would love to hear what you have to say, uh, and he'll be down in there as well. Uh, Ethan, thanks for being on the show today. Totally. Thanks so much for having me. All right, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.